Well, good morning, friends. It's lovely to see you. My name is Trevor Keen. I'm the Assistant Minister here in First Port of Down, and you're very welcome along this morning to our Worship at Home service. Please allow me just to begin with a few uh, announcements that need to be made. Obviously, we're not meeting for worship this evening in person, but we are meeting online, 6.30 p.m. We'll continue our studies in James. You can find that on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, uh, or if you go to the church website, you'll be able to find a link to it there. We can meet on Wednesday evening for our usual Bible study, but again, that will be uploaded to the usual channels. Afterwards, it is our plan, as we had last week, to have a time of prayer at around 8 p.m. And again, you'll find the details for that on our Facebook page uh, or again on the church bulletin. Next Sunday, we hope to resume in-person services both in the morning and in the evening. Now that needs a little bit of unpacking. In the morning, we're going to have two services, much as we have done for any of the other in-person services we've had at Harvest or Remembrance Sunday. There will be two services. It will be a 9.30 service and an 11.30 service. As before, we're going to ask you to book in this time, however, it will be slightly different. We've decided to use Eventbrite to book our services. Uh, so if you go onto our church Facebook page, if you go onto the church bulletin, you'll find the links there for booking in. We have decided to try and make our 9.30 service a little bit more family friendly. That will mean that the prayers will be slightly shorter, the sermon will be slightly shorter. There will be a children's address at the 9.30 service. So if you have a young family, please plan to, to come to that service. Uh, it will perhaps be noisy. It may not be uh, as still as the 11.30 service. So please, if you have young children, please plan to come to that. Uh, and equally, uh, if you prefer the calmness and the stillness, please plan to come to our 11.30 service. If you can't manage the Eventbrite booking system, uh, please feel free to phone Kirsty Lee uh, or text Kirsty Lee and she will gladly take your booking. So that's next Sunday at 11.30 and 9.30. But we're also hoping to resume our in-person services next Sunday evening at half past six. Uh, and next Sunday evening at half past six, we plan to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together. Again, we're asking you to book in again using the Eventbrite uh, booking system. If you can't manage that, again, please phone Kirsty Lee. If you'd like to join with us at home, uh, we will be using little uh, individual sealed packs. Uh, please speak to Robin to organize the distribution of a pack. It was with deep sadness that we learned in the past week of the death of Arnold Slater, our much esteemed former elder. And we commit Joan and Karen and Rosie in the wider family circle into the care of the Lord. Let us hear what the Lord says in his word. Psalm 116, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. And it's in that great assurance that we draw near this morning. It's in that great assurance that we draw together this morning, that the Lord does indeed hear us, that the Lord delights to hear his people praise his name, that the Lord delights to hear the voice of his people. Let's turn our hearts to him now in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning indeed that you do love to hear the voice of your people. We give you thanks, Father, that you incline your ear to us, that you listen to us in all of the changing scenes of life. You listen to your people. When we cry out of a heart that is broken with grief, you listen. When we sing praise out of a heart that is overflowing with joy, you listen. We thank you, Father, that you are the God who is sovereign, the God who is in control of all and sees all. And we pray that you would go before us now, that you would bless our time of worship. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're grateful to the music group who have recorded some Christmas carols for us or, or more Christmas songs for us. Uh, and we're going to uh, listen now and join together as they lead us in the bleak midwinter.
Well, friends, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning indeed for the wonder of the Incarnation. We thank you for the wonder of God made flesh. We thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ came as that little baby in Bethlehem, that he came in that manger, that he knew what it was to be man. He knew what it is to be tempted in every way, just as we are. And yet, Father, we thank you for that wonderful truth that he is without sin. We know our own faults and failings, Father. We know how easy it is for us to be tempted into sin. And yet, Father, we thank you for the wonder that Jesus Christ never sinned. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that he humbled himself, as Paul puts it. That he thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead humbled himself. Heavenly Father, if Jesus Christ came as a king reigning on a throne, we know that that would have been humility. But yet we thank you, Father, that he came as a servant. We thank you that he came as a baby. That he was dependent on his mother Mary for all that he needed. We thank you, Father, for the humility of Christ in his life. We remember his words that the birds of the air have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We remember that very famous occasion whenever people were trying to trick him about whether he should pay taxes to Caesar or not. And he had to ask someone for a denarius. He didn't even have that basic unit of currency. He didn't even have that small amount of money. We thank you, Father, for the way that he humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. We thank you, Father, that isn't where the story ends and that isn't where Paul leaves it. Paul reminds us that that is not Christ's estate this morning, that he is exalted this morning, that he reigns from your right hand on high this morning, that he ever lives there and intercedes for his people, Father. What a wonderful truth that is for us to know that Christ knows our infirmities to know that Christ knows our weaknesses to know that Christ has experienced the temptations that we have experienced and yet without sin to know this morning that he lives at your right hand and intercedes for us what wonderful reassurance that is what wonderful comfort that is this morning we thank you father for the recent relaxation and restrictions that mean we will be able to gather together from next Sunday. We pray that you would bless us as we come together as your people this morning. We pray that you would keep us united as your people. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for our sin as we come, that you would cleanse us from all of our iniquity. We know the sin in our hearts. We know the sin that so easily entangles. We know the sin that clings so closely to us. And so we pray this morning, Father, that you would cleanse us, that you would purify us, that you would go before us. And we pray, Father, that you would do us good as we come together to worship you this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Phil, Phil Hammond is going to bring us our Bible reading, then we're going to have our children's talk, and then we will join together in praise of God again in the words of the hymn, See Him Lying on a Bed. Of straw. Thank you, Phil. The reading is from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. The angel told her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor to David. And he will reign over Israel. 
forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen in the Virgin? The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Well, boys and girls, it's lovely to see you this morning. It's great to have you along to our church at home service here. I'm going to let you into a little secret this morning. I wonder if any of you can guess where I am. That's right, I'm in the church office. Now, the little secret that I'm going to let you into is I've taken over the church office. You see, Kirsty Lee has been working from home and I thought, well, if she isn't going to use the office, then I may as well use it. It's great working in the church office because you have lots of space. You get a nice big desk that you can work on. You can put lots of books on it, read lots of different things, and you can make a bit of a mess and no one says anything to you. It's great working at the church office because it's nice and quiet. You hardly ever get disturbed by anything, certainly not by children anyway. I'll tell you another little thing why it's great. Now, don't tell any members of the Congregational Committee this, but it's great because there's a little electric heater that you can put on and it makes the room nice and toasty. But it's great as well because sometimes you do get visitors. You do get people who you don't expect to see. You might be sitting reading a book and suddenly someone will just appear at the door. Sometimes they just want to have a little chat with you, see how you're getting on. But sometimes they bring you news as well. They might tell you about someone who's in hospital. They might tell you about someone who's sick. They might tell you about lots of, of different things. And it's great to have those conversations. It's great to get those unexpected visitors who bring us news. And in the Bible reading that we read this morning from Luke's Gospel, there was an unexpected visitor. Mary was going about her daily life. Mary was just doing all of the chores that she had to do as a, a young woman, as a young girl, when suddenly there was this unexpected visitor. Suddenly there was an angel in the room with her. Now, understandably, Mary was a little bit afraid by that. I don't know about you, but I would be pretty afraid if an angel just turned up in my living room. But the angel says to her, look, Mary, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. And the angel, just like the visitors bring me news, the angel brings Mary some news. She says to Mary, look, you're going to have a baby. And this baby won't just be any ordinary baby. This baby won't be any run-of-the-mill baby. This baby is going to be called the Son of the Most High. Now, what does that mean? The angel was telling Mary that the baby that she was going to have was going to be the Son of God. Now, we all know who that baby is, don't we? That baby is Jesus. And you see, boys and girls, that's the, the great news. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's great to get all of the presents. It's great to be able to see family and friends again after all this time. But the real reason that we celebrate Christmas is that this unexpected visitor brought Mary great news. That she was going to have a baby who would be the Son of God. And that baby would be the one who would save us from our sin. I want you to remember that this Christmas for me in the midst of all the presents and in the midst of all of the, the different things that go on around Christmas. Remember who this baby is, the Son of God who would save us from our sin.
Well, friends, I'll encourage you this morning to have God's Word open in front of you. Turn to the passage, please, that Philip read for us from Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and these verses 26 through 38. Luke 1, 26 through 38. And we're going to think about the whole of that section together. I love watching sports documentaries on the TV. There's quite a, a few good ones on Amazon Prime at the minute entitled All or Nothing. You know, they'll follow a sports team around for a season. There are some of them. They follow American football teams around. There's one where they follow Manchester City around. There's one where they follow Spurs around. Uh, and there's one where they follow the, the all-black rugby team around for a season. And one of the things that it brings home to you is how good the managers are at that elite level, how good they are at reading their players, how good they are at knowing what each player needs in order to get the best out of them. For some players, it might be that they need the hairdryer treatment they need shouted at in order to get them out of the comfort zone, in order to get them thinking, well, I'm going to show the manager how good I really am. For other players, it might be that they need a, a, an arm around the shoulder or whatever the equivalent is in a COVID-secure world that we seem to have to live in now. That, that makes them feel safe, that makes them feel comfortable, that makes them feel wanted, and so they produce better performances on the pitch. And of course, that isn't true of just sport. It's true of any management. It, part of management is knowing how to get the best out of the people under your management. But as we come to this passage in Luke chapter 1 this morning, I think we see something similar from God. God knows what his people need. God knows how to encourage his people. God knows how to uh, enable his people to press on, to make progress in the Christian life. You see, last week we saw Zechariah doubting the promise of God. Last week we saw Zechariah thinking, well, how can this be? I'm an old man. And because of that doubt, because of the doubt that the message of the message that the angel Gabriel brought to him, Zechariah was struck dumb. Now, of course, Zechariah should have known better. Zechariah was a priest. Zechariah was one who represented the people before God. He should have known better. And today we see Mary doubting, doubting not so much what the angel says to her, but doubting how it's going to come to pass. She says to the angel, look, how can this be? How can I have a son? I'm a virgin. I'm not yet married. The angel doesn't scold her, doesn't chastise her the way that he did with Zechariah. But instead he offers her evidence. He says to her, look, Go and see your relative Elizabeth. People said she was barren. People used to to whisper behind their, 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 their hands about Elizabeth. But go and see, she's pregnant. Nothing's impossible with God. Mary doesn't doubt the message, but she doubts how it's going to come to pass. And the Lord offers her the proof, the evidence that she needs in order to, to, to make progress in the Christian life. We want to think about three things, see three things from this passage in Luke 1. Firstly, we'll think about this angelic visitor. Secondly, we'll think about a promised king. And then thirdly, we'll think about the proof offered. An angelic visitor, a promised king, and the proof offered. So firstly then, this angelic visitor, an angelic visitor. And we see that in verses 26 through 29. We finished last week by noticing how Elizabeth had kept herself hidden for five months. We saw that great statement that she made at the end of the section we looked at. Verse 25, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me, what? To take away my reproach among the people. And we notice then as we come to verse 26 that this same angel, the the angel Gabriel, is on the move again. This time he's sent to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. He's sent from God to a city of Galilee. Notice please, just in passing, just very quickly, that that's always the direction of revelation. It comes from God to man. It comes from God to man. God has revealed himself in the scriptures. God has revealed himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has revealed himself in the world that we see around us. That's always the direction of travel for revelation, from God to man. Man is not at liberty to make up revelation for himself. It comes from God. And he comes from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now get out of your head here any pictures of a kind of bustling metropolis. Get any pictures here out of your head of the idea of Belfast or Lisbon. This is a a much more insignificant place. This is a much more backwater place, probably somewhere like Carrick. And after being sent to that relatively insignificant place, he is sent to a relatively insignificant woman. Just an ordinary young girl. A girl who's betrothed to be married. A girl who's promised to be married to this man, Joseph. And she was called 
Mary. Now that Gabriel would be sent from God to Nazareth is amazing in itself. But when he gets to Nazareth, he isn't sent to the mayor. He isn't sent to the elected leaders. He isn't sent to the most important person in Nazareth. Rather, he's sent to this young girl going about her ordinary, everyday life. And of course, this is what Paul picks up on in 1 Corinthians, isn't it? God chose the weak things to shame the strong. God chose the things that are foolish in order to shame the things that are wise. God chose the things that are not in order to shame the things that are. God doesn't always work according to our plans and purposes. God doesn't always work according to our social status and our social understanding. God doesn't always work according to our plans of who's important and who isn't. You see, it's easy to fawn over people today. We can fawn over their intellect, we can fawn over their wealth, we can fawn over their standing in society. And yet God here reminds us that it's often the most insignificant things. It's often the seemingly most insignificant people whom he chooses to work through, whom he chooses to achieve great things through. Not the rich and the powerful, not the influential, but this young girl. And note the detail that Luke records for us. Luke, remember, of course, is a a trained historian. Luke is very careful about the detail that he records for us. And he tells us, verse 27, that he came to this city of Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now, as a Jewish person reading this, your ears would have pricked up at that. As a Jewish person reading this, your ears would have been beginning to tingle at that. All sorts of connections would have been made in your brain. Here we have the messenger of God coming to someone who's from the house of David. God has been silent for 400 years. There's been no, not a word from heaven. And now God is coming. God's messenger is coming to someone who is of the house of David. You would have been thinking, well, what's going to happen next? Why? What's the message? I remember during the the early summer, kind of April, May time, there was a, a daily government briefing on the state of the nation around coronavirus. And sometimes you would get a little a little sense of a really big announcement that was to come. It might be, you know, trailed by Laura Kunzberg at the BBC or, or whoever at ITV. And it got you thinking. It got you excited in some senses. You were thinking, well, what's coming? What's this really big announcement that's about to come? What is it that the government are about to announce? You had to keep watching to find out the reality, but it got you excited. It got you thinking. And so too for the Jewish person here, as Gabriel comes to someone who is of the house of David, it gets them thinking. It gets them excited. It gets them wondering, well, what is coming next? What is this announcement about to be? Could it be the Messiah we've been waiting for? He comes and speaks to her. He assures her, verse 28, of the Lord's favour. Greetings, Gabriel says, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. But as always, this appearance of an angel brings fear. It brings uncertainty. This appearance of the messenger of God brings this kind of uncertainty we see that verse 29 she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting that it might be what does it mean to be favored by the lord why is there an angel standing in my front room you see this is why zechariah and mary i think are so different you see zechariah should have known better Zechariah was, after all, a priest. Zechariah, after all, represented the people before God. Zechariah, after all, offered the sacrifices for sin. He should have known better. But don't forget, at this point in history, heaven has been silent for 400 years. There's been no word from the Lord. There's been no new revelation of God himself. And so for Mary, this ordinary Jewish girl, I think it's perfectly understandable that she thinks, well, what's going on here she's nothing to reference it against she's no way of processing what's happening to her and so naturally she's trying to figure out what's going on what does it mean to be favored by the lord we see the angelic visitor but secondly then we see the promised king the promised king and we see that in verses 30 through 33 verses 30 through 33 a promised king Over and against her fear, over and against her suspicion, over and against her worry, the angel says to her, verse 30, Look, Mary, don't be afraid. 
Why? Because you found favour with God. She was wondering what sort of greeting this might be. She was wondering what it meant to be favoured by the Lord. And, and Gabriel says, look, don't worry. Don't be afraid. You have found favour with God. It's good news that I'm bringing you. It's excellent news that I'm bringing you. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High. Now this is quite a promise the angels delivering, isn't it? It's quite a lot for this young girl to take in. Here's this young betrothed woman, this young virgin, being told that she's about to have a son. And more than that, being told that the son that she's about to have will actually be the son of the Most High God. Yet it isn't even finished there because the Lord will give to him, the Lord will grant to him the throne of his father David. There's so much Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled here. So many Old Testament promises that are coming true even in this one scene. We want to stop just for a moment here and think about all of the promises that are coming true. All of the promises that are being fulfilled here. Of course, first of all, most, what would you say, most obviously... We see the promise, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14 promises that the virgin will conceive and bear a son and his name will be Emmanuel. His name will be God with us. Here we have the angel Gabriel announcing the fulfillment of that promise. The son that you bear, Mary, will be the son of the Most High God. He will be God with us. Yet there's even more here and there's something I think that's even more I don't want to say significant, but there's something that's even more important for us to grasp here. And we can easily miss it. Because notice how Gabriel describes this son that will be born. Look at the very end of verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Second Samuel 7 is one of our key texts as we understand the kingdom of Israel. It's one of our key texts as we understand our covenant theology. And every Jew would have known it. Every Jew would have remembered it. Every Jew would have understood the implications that it had for their society. 2 Samuel 7, David wants to build a house for God. David wants to build a temple for God to dwell in. But over and against that, God says, well, look, no, I'm going to build a house for you. And more than that, more than that, you will never have a, uh, never fail to have a man who will sit on the throne of Israel. That was the great promise. That was the great covenant that the Lord bound himself to in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This promise of everlasting kingship. This promise that there will be an eternal king on the throne of Israel. And of course, as the Old Testament progresses, we see the failure of David's sons, don't we? We see their slide into apostasy. We see the division of the kingdom into two parts. We see eventually, of course, the exile of the people and their kings. But the Lord has promised to Samuel 7. The Lord has assured David that he will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. He has promised him that there will be this everlasting king. So who is it? Who is it going to be? And Gabriel gives us the answer here. It will be Jesus. It will be the son of Mary who will be this everlasting king. He will be the one who will sit on the throne of Israel. He will be the one who will be the one that all Israel had been waiting for. He will be the one who will succeed where all the earthly kings failed. He is coming to restore the throne of David. That's why all the pious Jews' ears would have been tingling. That's why they all would have been wondering when this angel is sent from God to a person who is of the throne of the line of David, sorry. They know the promises surrounding David. They know the expectation that's there for this eternal king. And Christ is, of course, the fulfillment of that promise. The one who they've been waiting for. The king, the ruler, the promised Messiah. And, of course, this morning, friends, Jesus is the one that the world has been waiting on. Not just the house of Israel, but the whole world. The one whom the whole world needs to know that this is no ordinary baby. This is no everyday run-of-the-mill baby. This baby would be the one sin-bearing sacrifice to be the saviour of mankind. And that's what the angel announces to Mary. That's who your baby will be. But I wonder this morning, friends, do you know Jesus like that? Do you know him for who he is, for who he truly 
is the sin-bearing saviour of mankind. You see, it's easy to get sentimental at Christmas, isn't it? It's easy to see that lovely picture of the manger. It's easy to see, get sentimental around that lovely picture of Mary and Joseph peering over the baby Jesus. It's easy to get lost in the, the, the kind of cuteness of that scene. Yet, friends, that baby in the manger would grow to be the man on the cross. In the shadow of the manger stands the reality of the cross of Christ. That's who Jesus is. That's who this baby is. The one who comes to take away the sin of the world. But do you know him for yourself? Has he taken away your sin this morning? And notice the promise of verse 33. The angel promises Mary and says, look, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. This kingdom that Jesus is coming to usher in is an everlasting kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. I was trying to think of the, the best way to illustrate this. You know, imagine being Daniel in the kingdom of Babylon. You looked around at the opulence. You looked around at the power. You looked around at the, the sheer vastness of the empire. And it must have been hard to imagine a time whenever the Babylonian empire wouldn't exist. And yet here we are today and the Babylonian empire is long gone. Think about the British Empire in the 1800s. It was so vast, so powerful, it covered so much of the world. It would be hard if you were living in the 1800s to imagine a world without the British Empire. And yet by and large the British Empire today is gone, certainly in the form that it existed in the 1800s anyway. Why? Because our earthly kingdoms rise and fall. Because our earthly kingdoms wax and wane, but the kingdom that Jesus Christ is coming to usher in, the kingdom that Jesus Christ is coming to establish, is an eternal kingdom. It will be a kingdom that is without end. His is the kingdom that will endure throughout eternity. There's so much talk of uncertainty these days. Brexit is bringing uncertainty. Covid brings uncertainty. It's easy to feel lost in the midst of that uncertainty it's easy to feel tossed and harried and worried in the midst of all of that uncertainty but if you want certainty this morning where do you go you go to the kingdom of christ if you want certainty in your citizenship this morning where do you go you go to the kingdom of christ because his is the kingdom that will last forever his is the kingdom that is unshakable all our earthly kingdoms will rise and fall but the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will stand forever. There is certainty. There is surety. There and there alone is hope this morning. We've seen the promised king. We've seen the angelic visitor. And then thirdly and finally, we think about the proof offered. The proof offered. And we see that in verses 34 through 38. Mary, probably fairly enough, says to the angel Gabriel, well, look, how can this be? I, I, I'm not married. I'm a virgin. I'm betrothed to this man, Joseph. So how can this happen? How can I conceive and bear a son? And the angel announces, verse 35, look, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Notice the Trinitarian shape of the Incarnation. Notice the Trinitarian shape of redemption. It's what we see time and time and time again. The Father sends the angel Gabriel to Mary. The angel Gabriel announces that the, the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and that the, what is conceived in her will be holy. What is conceived in her will be the Son of the Most High God. There's the Trinitarian shape of redemption, the Trinitarian shape of of the incarnation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work in redemption and in incarnation. Luke here refutes a, a Greek idea that if a child was to be born of the gods, it would be a child that was born naturally. It would be a child that was born by intercourse between the gods and woman. And instead, what Luke says is this child who's born to you will be holy. This, of course, doesn't mean that Mary was blameless. It doesn't mean that she was blameless herself. But rather that what was conceived in her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit would be holy, blameless. 
It's a reminder to his friends that Jesus Christ isn't just an idealized version of us. He isn't just the best version of us. He isn't us on a really good day. He is holy. He is blameless. He is the Son of God. He is utterly different from us. But he shares our nature. He is both God and man in one person forever. If that isn't enough, the angel offers her the proof and says, Look, go and see your relative Elizabeth, her who was barren, her who was mocked, her who people used to talk about behind her back. Go and see her. And she's six months pregnant. That's the proof. God can do anything. If he's done it for her, he can certainly do it for you. And Mary says, verse 38, Look, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it, let it be so. The promised king has come. The proof has been offered, friends. Let us submit ourselves to him. Let us let him rule as king in our lives. The baby of the manger is the saviour of the cross. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the incarnation. We thank you, Father, for the cross of Calvary that stood at the end of Christ's earthly life. We pray, Father, that you would help us to submit ourselves to him, that you would help us to enthrone him as the, the king in our lives. We thank you that his kingdom indeed will last forever, that his kingdom has no end. And we pray, Father, that we would indeed be citizens of that kingdom. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to hear now from another one of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland's mission partners who the work of the United Appeal goes to support. This time we're, we're visiting Anis and Olga who work in the University of St. Petersburg in Russia. Uh, Anis teaches systematic and practical theology uh, and Olga helps with the translation of that into Russian. We'll hand over to Anis and Olga now. Hi, I am Anis. Hello, and I am Olga. Здравствуйте. We are PCI Global Mission Workers in Russia. Here we are involved with the academic theological training of church leaders. Anis's main task is to develop new courses in practical theology and systematic theology on both bachelor and master levels. And Olga has the wonderful, difficult task of translating and interpreting for me and um, translating this material into Russian so that students could have something to read. The situation with COVID-19 has had a big impact on our lives and the life of the university. Yes, we have been teaching online since middle of March 2020. Churches have been closed and they also did their teaching online. It also had a a big effect on the financial stability of uh, the university and many of the personnel had to ta take about a 50% pay cut. We are so grateful for your support for the United Appeal that helps us to serve God's mission to the world in this place where God is so needed. Yes, here are some points uh, that you can pray for now with us as you seek to go deeper and wider into God's mission in this world. Please pray for Anas for his wisdom and discernment and inspiration when he develops very difficult programs. And please pray for Olga as she has to translate this into a language, a difficult language, but also a language where many of these theological terms do not exist. Please pray for our students and lecturers who serve the Lord all over Russia in contexts that are not always positive towards evangelical Christians. And please pray for the financial stability uh, of the university. It is a crucial institution uh, serving the evangelical Christian community in Russia. Remember that we continue to pray for you as a congregation of PCI, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may God continue to empower you, strengthen you as you minister where God has planted you at this time to be his witnesses. We pray for God's blessings on your families and thank you again for your love, prayers and support. Until next time, das Vidania.
Well, friends, let's join our hearts together in prayer as we pray for each other in the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we recognize, Father, that there are some who are coming with heavy hearts. We want to pray, especially this morning, for the Slater family, for Joan, for Karen, and for Rosie. May you bless them, Father, at this time of loss. May you wrap your arms of love and care around them. May they know your presence with them in a very real way. We thank you for Arnold's life, and we thank you for the legacy that he has left. And we pray, Father, that you would keep the wider family circle in your care and in your love this morning, we ask. We remember Annas and Olga and the work that they're doing in St. Petersburg in Russia as they teach at the Christian University of St. Petersburg. We pray, Father, that you would bless them in the days that lie ahead. As they reminded us of the difficulties that they faced with COVID-19, of staff having to take 50% pay cuts, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would encourage them. We pray that you would keep them, that you would meet every need that they may have. We pray for Annas as he continues to deliver his lectures in practical and systematic theology. We pray that you would help him to see the, the, the wider picture of Christian education and Christian ministry for the way that he is able to, to help shape the direction that the church takes. May you encourage him with that thought. We pray for Olga as she translates the, the work that Annas does into Russian so that the students can, can access it more easily. May you bless her in that ministry. As we think about the, the, the Christian University of St. Petersburg, Father, we also think about our own Union Theological College and we pray for the students as they enter the, the, the final week before the Christmas break. We pray, Father, that you would bless them. Pray that you would encourage them in the midst of all the assignments that have to be done, all the work that still needs to be done. May you give them the strength for this final hurdle, we ask. May you encourage them in their work. We pray, Father, for all of those students that it would not just be a mere academic head knowledge that they've gained, that it wouldn't just be a, a, a tick box exercise so that they can say, well, we've done this assignment, that we've done that, that we've finished this course. But we pray, Father, that that intellectual knowledge they gain would shape their hearts, would encourage them in their walk with you, would strengthen their most holy faith and would prepare them for a, a lifetime of ministry within the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, we ask. Remember the principal, Stafford Carson, as he gets ready to finally retire, Heavenly Father, and hand over the reins to Gordon, Gordon Campbell. We pray that you would bless Stafford in his retirement. We pray that you would uh, give him a sense of the ministry that you still have for him to do, a sense of, of the work that still lies ahead of him. We pray that you would bless Gordon as he takes on an increasingly uh, busy schedule between teaching New Testament and being the principal of the college. May you bless him. May you give, give him the, the, the grace and the ability to get all of the work done that he needs to get done. And we pray, Father, that it would be an encouragement to him and an encouragement to all the students in the months that lie ahead. Remember our friend Michael McLennan as he continues uh, to battle with his sickness. May you, Father, restore him. May you build him up. May you strengthen him in the days that lie ahead, we ask. We remember all of those, Heavenly Father, within our congregation who are sick, who are suffering, who need your special care and concern placed upon them this morning. May you be near to them. May they have that assurance of your presence with them. May they know your hand upholding them and keeping them. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful news that we've had over the past few weeks about the vaccine, for the way that it seems to be so effective in, in preventing and treating the, the spread of COVID-19. We pray, Father, that as that vaccine is rolled out, we pray that that success would continue. We pray that more and more vaccines would become available, that life in some senses would be able to return to a sense of normality. We pray for the government as they seek to, to think about that rollout program. May you give them wisdom. May you give them clarity of thought. May they see how to best achieve this immunity that we need to achieve as a community. We thank you, Father, that we can come back together next Sunday as a body of your believers. May you encourage us. May you strengthen us with that thought. 
may we, Father, return joyfully. May it indeed be a source of great joy to us that we can return to the Lord's house with the Lord's people. Continue with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to bring our time together to a close this morning with the words of tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit our Comforter rest, remain and abide with us all, both now and evermore. Amen and Amen. Well friends, thank you once again for watching. It was great to have you with us this morning. Thank you to the tech team. Thank you to the music team. Uh, thank you to Phil for reading all of the people who made this service possible this morning. If you've watched with us, please just leave us a little comment just so that we can have that sense of fellowship, that sense of unity together as we worship the Lord. Thank you.